Uh, if we're in a conversation and there's something going on, maybe he's sitting at his computer, he'll be looking at us, talking away, his eyes will turn and he's gone from the conversation. It's not that he doesn't care, he does care about us, he loves his family a lot, he just doesn't hear a word anymore, it's gone. He's gone from the conversation, but he isn't listening. Or you view God like my landlord. We have spent, sent several messages to our landlord asking to get the hot water fixed. He's received the request, he's heard our plea, he understands that we don't like how bad our hot water is, but he doesn't care, or at least not enough to upgrade the system. God's not like either of those things though. God does hear, God does care, and he does answer. Let's pray and then we'll delve into that. Lord, you are the sovereign God who has reached out to his creation. Lord, you have made yourself known to us. Lord, we thank you that you have provided us with an avenue for connection. Um, Lord, you provided us with your word, a guide to righteousness, a guide, a sure way of knowing you. Lord, we ask that you would help us humble ourselves this morning as we approach your word. Uh, send your spirit that it may challenge us who have wrong understandings of prayer and comfort those of us who are wrestling with this challenging topic. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're continuing our series, looking at some of the assurances that God gives throughout Scripture. We've looked at the assurance of salvation, that we can be sure we are saved. We've looked at the assurance of forgiveness, that those who are in Christ are forgiven from their sins. The assurance of victory, that no matter how tempted we are, how bad our life may seem, we still have victory over that. And it's all rooted in his perfect and unchanging character, a father that loves us so deeply. Today we're going to be looking at the assurance that God gives us that he will answer our prayers. So those who are in Christ can be assured that those that they have their prayers answered. We're going to be looking at three things this morning. First, we're going to call, see that God calls us to ask God wants us to bring our prayers before him and our petitions to him. Secondly, God calls us to conform, to submit our wills to his sovereign will. And finally, God calls us to trust. Even when it doesn't make sense, we can rely on his good and faithful and kind and unchanging character. So the first point is God in the heavens, the God who loves us deeply, calls us to ask. He asks us to approach and to give him our petitions. You might have asked yourself this question, does God really care if I pray or not? If he's going to do whatever he wants anyway, why bother praying for anything? But it's not like that. We should pray. The Bible gives us a couple of really good reasons why. Firstly, not praying is not an option Jesus sees it as the mark of a believer. It's the everyday experience of someone who claims to be a follower of him. We see an example of this in Matthew 6, when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray. Count how many times Jesus uses the word when in this passage. We're looking at chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Or verse 6, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Or verse 7, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. That's three times in one short passage. It's not if you pray, it's when you pray. So prayer is expected. It's part of the daily rhythm of a believer. Secondly, the very question of should I bother shows a lot about how you view prayer and God. I think we tend to treat prayer like a bushfire last resort. I grew up in the hills and there would be people that would fight to the very last minute before this raging fire is coming to flee to these last resort refuges. I think we treat prayer the same way. We'll work longer hours, we'll read more books, get better sleep, eat healthier, install more app blockers. 
And then as a very last-ditch effort, the, like the worst-case scenario has come up, I think we should pray about this. I don't think that's how God wants us to pray. I think he wants us to pray about our everyday struggles. I think we see that um, one of the most tremendous and comforting aspects of Christian theology is that God actually cares about your everyday struggles. Look at Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Secondly, he wants us to pray confident that he will answer. Look at 1 John 5, 14 through 15. And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. We can pray boldly, knowing that the God of the universe, the God who is ultimately intimately relational through his Son and the Spirit, hears our prayers and will provide an answer. And we see that it's actually really good to ask for things. John 16, 24, which is our memory verse for this week, says, until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Matthew 7, verse 7 through 8 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So in obedience to God and with confidence that he is eager to hear our requests, we are called to pray. Not just about the big things, but the little things too. Second point is that we're called to conform. We're called to submit our will to God. Look back at 1 John 15 says, we are assured that God hears our prayers and that he will answer if they are in accordance with his will. So some theologians claim that we can change God's will, right? You know, we can name it and claim it. We can will it into existence. We can, with our, you know, flawless rhetoric, convince God that his way isn't as good as our way. I think it's a tremendous gift that God doesn't listen to me in that respect. I think the world would be a terrible place if God did everything I told him to do. My life would be a lot worse. I think it would be an unmitigated disaster for all of us, right? And I think God's in the heavens waiting for us to provide him with the right information, the right input. Nothing surprises God. He's established his will from before the foundations of the earth. So there is a bit of a caveat here. This isn't just a blanket promise that God will give us anything we want, right? It says we must, it must be in accordance with his will. We see the same thing in John 16, 24. It says, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. The principle is the same. The point of the John 16 passage isn't that as long as we tack Jesus' name onto the end of a prayer, we get whatever we want. It's a guarantee. Sorry, yeah, sorry. It's that you are acting as God's agent. Would Jesus put his name on this request? Would he get his stamp of approval? So praying in Jesus' name signifies praying in accordance with his will, who he is, his character, and his purposes. It means seeking what Jesus would seek and aligning our prayers with his will and desires. So, so do prayers actually do anything? If we can't change God's mind, why bother praying? I think there are a couple of points to make on this. I think firstly, prayer brings us into alignment with God's will. God's greatest will is that we get to know Him. So prayer is not primarily about getting stuff from God, but rather it's to promote friendship and relationship with Him. Oswald Chambers puts it this way, the point of prayer is that you may get to know God better. We also see this clearly in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Notice the relational familiarity. The Father, 
and the adoration and worship. Holy be your name. So prayer isn't just about asking for things. It's about developing the relationship we have with God. That is, in and itself, a privilege. And secondly, prayers do have an effect. Ligon Duncan puts it this way. In prayer, we become God's instrument to effect his will, and thus, in his grace, God ordains to work out his plan with the use of prayers. We'll look at that in a second. It's a complicated quote. Alec Mottier also says, prayer is one of the laws of God by which he runs this world. So what Duncan and Mottier are saying is that God, in his infinite plan and infinite wisdom, has ordained that you would have a need, has ordained that you would pray, and ordained that he would respond to your prayer. We see examples of this all throughout Scripture, but I'm going to look at Daniel 9. In Daniel 9, Daniel is praying earnestly for the forgiveness and restoration of Israel. Now, it took a long time for this answer, a prayer to, prayer to be answered. But if you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you see that he does answer that prayer. So we can have confidence that our prayers are before a sovereign God who will answer. I love the modern age of communication, but I really don't like how when I send a message on like Messenger or WhatsApp or whatever, it shows that I've seen, the, like when I receive a message, it shows that I've seen it. I don't like that. It puts too much pressure on me to respond then and there. I don't like that pressure. But if we look at 1 John 5 again, it says, If we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. So not, God has not only seen your message, it's already been answered. God knew you would pray. God ordained that you would pray. And in his divine will, ordained that he would answer your prayer. But it doesn't always seem like he answers, right? Sometimes it feels like God has left you on red. But he does answer. And there are four possible answers that God can give us. Yes, no, later, and greater. Sometimes God gives an immediate, or at least close to immediate, yes to prayer. Sometimes he does heal that cancer. Sometimes you do get that immediate peace in times of trial. Sometimes he does help us find our luggage. I don't think there's anything outside of God's purview. One from Scripture is Peter's miraculous release from prison in Acts chapter 12. Other Christians were praying fervently for Peter's release. And would you believe it? God answered. Peter was released. Sometimes God says no. No. We see that in Deuteronomy 3, when Moses is pleading with God to enter the promised land. But God says, no. Or Paul's thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians. Paul is pleading, please. He pleads three times with God. But God says, no. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul came to understand that this thorn kept him humble and reliant on God. Sometimes we'll get a no because our prayers are in direct conflict with God's explicit will in Scripture. Here are a few examples. Prayers that might bless sin. If you ask for, for God to bless your affair, I think he's probably going to say no. Or if he's going to keep feeding your idols of greed or lust, it's going to be a no. Sometimes we don't see prayer answered because we give up instantly. We assume that God has said no or that he doesn't care. But sometimes what he's looking for is us to grow in reliance on him and trusting him and persisting. Don Carson puts it this way. Sometimes our lack of persistence in prayer is not a reflection of our great maturity in that I've already laid this before the Lord and I'm at rest, but rather a reflection of our sheer unbelief. Some of us in our praying are rather like nasty little boys who go up to the doorbell, ring it and run. We're not really expecting an answer. And if an answer does come too quickly, we won't be there in any case to receive it. Look at Luke 18, 1 through 8, which says, this is a parable that Jesus is telling his disciples. So one day, Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city. He said, 
who neither feared God or, get, or cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while. But finally, he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. The point of this is that we diligently and humbly and scripturally pray if we are certain that our prayers are not in direct conflict with the will of God, that explicit will that is. There is no harm in praying regular and recurrent prayers. Three things might happen when we do that. Firstly, we realize that what we were asking for is not what was best for us. Secondly, God might answer suddenly, but after a very long wait. Three, God slowly answers our prayers. Sometimes these prayers don't look like they're being answered. It's only when we look back that we see that God has faithfully been answering with a yes. Maybe it's a prayer for better self-control, or prayer to be more diligent in your Bible reading and praying, or prayer that you would grow in assurance of salvation or forgiveness or victory. These take time to answer, don't they? I don't think we, it would be pretty rare for someone to go from immature to mature overnight, right? If they're praying for it, they're going to see progress slowly. So these things teach us to rely on God, to trust that his way is better than our way. Sometimes God answers prayers in ways that we wouldn't expect, in greater ways than we could expect. Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, surely prayed when he was a young man for a son. What would have happened if they received that son during the young years? We would never have known about it. It would have been just another son in history. God gave them something better than they could have imagined. John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet before the Messiah. So God, in answering, can say, yes, what you have prayed for is good and proper, and as your loving Father, I'll give it to you. Sometimes it's a no, this isn't for you. It's either explicitly out of God's will, or God has a better plan. Sometimes God is using the process to grow your faith, grow your trust, grow your confidence. The waiting is itself a gift from God. And sometimes God gives us more than we could possibly understand to ask for. Now, I think there are some difficult challenges for us, right? What about when we pray good prayers and God says no? That leads us to point three. The challenge comes when we are praying for things that we think are very good, but God says no. There are a couple of ways of looking at this. Firstly, God might be withholding something that is bad for you. Look at Matthew 7, 9 through 11, which says, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or, if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We learn from this passage that God only gives good gifts. If something is going to be bad for you, a loving Father will withhold it. If your son or daughter comes up to you asking for a snake, are you going to give them a snake? No. There's a quote thrown around by a lot of pastors. It says, Sometimes I thank God for the prayers left unanswered. I can think of countless prayers that, if, that I've prayed that had God answered them, my life would be really difficult right now. I think we can understand that one, right? Many of you are parents. You know, you say no to your kid back flipping off a wall or swimming without floaties. They may not understand why, and it may not feel like you love them or care about them or what they want, but it is for their good, right? We get that. But what about times when it doesn't make sense? These are the really hard ones. Prayers like, save my grandpa. He doesn't believe in God. 
and he's just been diagnosed with cancer. Or help my depression. I don't know how long I can carry on with this. What do we do when the rubber hits the road like this? What do we do when we pray for days, for months, for years, and it just doesn't seem like God is answering, all right? Or even worse, when we pray and pray, and Grandpa does die, never demonstrating any relationship with God. This is where our theology matters. If we have a distorted view of God's character, we will have no answer to this question. And there is no easy answer to this question. There isn't some platitude we can slap on the situation and feel like it fixes everything. And I, I don't think we should. I don't think the Bible demands that we slap a smile on, pretend everything is dandy, and get on with our lives. These are tragic stories. Many of you have stories where God has, for no particular reason, no perceptible reason, said no. Times where it felt like God has betrayed the trust that you have put in him. Times where you spent hours begging with him for him only to say no. There's two things the Bible gives us for times like these. Firstly, the freedom and the framework to honestly lament in a faithful way. One of the greatest tragedies of the contemporary church is its almost complete inability to lament. But look at the Psalms. The Psalms are filled with accounts of feelings of complete brokenness, feelings of betrayal directed towards God, feelings of absolute desperation. Look at Psalm 38, where David is suffering both physical and emotional agony. Verses 2 and 3 say, Your arrows have pierced me, and your hand has come down on me. Because of your wrath, there is no health in my body. There is no soundness in my bones because of my sin. Notice how David directs his pain towards God. Your arrows, your hand, your wrath. And then in verses 21 and 22 says, Lord, do not forsake me. Do not be far from me, my God. Come quickly to help me, my Lord and Savior. At this point in David's life, God hasn't answered his prayers. Life is still rough. His enemies are mounting and he feels abandoned. Psalm 88 is even darker these are the last few verses of that psalm. This is how the psalm concludes. But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. Those are dark words, aren't they? That despair. And the Bible validates these feelings of pain, of suffering, of the desperate feeling of rejection from God. But that's not all Scripture has to offer. When we're in these moments, these moments where it feels like God, no, will crush us, what do we do? Firstly, take note that these psalms are prayers. These, this isn't petulant silence or a retreat from God. The psalmist runs to God with their pleas. They appeal to the one person who can solve their dilemma. There comes a point in almost every theological inquiry, a point where you have looked down every avenue. You've tried to see everything from every perspective. You've tried to rationalize and understand why something is the way it is. And prayer is no different. There comes a point after you have prayed and God has said no, where our only remaining option is to trust God and his character. We have the freedom. In fact, we have the command to lament. But ultimately, that, that lament must turn to trust. This doesn't have to be immediate. I think we have a tendency in the church to move on from lament way too quickly. And trust isn't easy. Easy. It's incredibly hard to imagine how a God who is good wouldn't answer a seemingly good prayer. I, I don't understand it. I can't explain it. I don't think anyone can. And I don't think it's easy. In fact, I think it's impossible to trust God and our own accord. 
We need help. But the beautiful thing is God has sent his spirit, our comforter, our helper in time of need. And this is why we have harped on about the unchanging and good character of God throughout this series. We do have a good father that loves us. We have a sovereign God who cares deeply about our pain and our sufferings and our trial and our lamenting and has shared in that pain in Christ. When we have that foundation to our theology, when we know that even if it doesn't make sense, God is working for our good and for his glory, only then are we able to trust that his decisions are good, always. They are always good, even when we don't understand them. But we do know that God does answer prayer and he's eager to foster relationship. He's eager for us to grow in our ability to trust him. And prayer achieves these things, even when the answer is no. Some of you eagle-eyed people might have seen the acronym in this sermon. God is calling us to act. God is calling us to ask in faith and in patience. God is calling us to conform in humility. God is calling us to trust that he is a good God. And so our prayers are a reflection of how we view God. We have a God that is eager to hear our pleadings. When we pray, we acknowledge that we need Him. We have confidence that in His sovereign will, He will most assuredly answer. We hope that He will conform our will with His will. And finally, we trust that even when we don't understand the answer, He is good and working for our good and his glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your unchanging, good, righteous, perfect character. Lord, you are the God who listens and answers our pleas. Lord, you know us intimately and you love us. Lord, how often do we treat prayer wrongly? How often do we prioritize the gift you have given us over the giver? Lord, help us approach your throne with confidence. Help us ask for big things and little things. Help us prioritize our relationship with you over anything else in this world. Help conform us to the image of your Son. Comfort those of us with unanswered prayer, those who are hurting and broken. Help us rely on you and your good and unchanging perfect character. In Jesus' good and perfect name, amen.